All right, so welcome everyone and thanks for joining. We'll get started. Uh, my name is Didier Lali. I'm part of the HP Dev team. We look after the HP Dev community. And uh, today with me is uh, Dimitri Andradis and from Red Hat. And um, this is our first of a series of uh, we call meetups. Last year, we had a, a number of talk, technology talk called Munch and Learn. Uh, which were more maybe a higher level and um, around uh, technology concepts and thought leadership, kind of product agnostic and vendor agnostic. We, we thought and we got feedback that we also wanted uh, more uh, in-depth uh, technical talks about uh, technology, open source uh, technology as well. So we kick in that uh, series of talks, which will be a monthly with uh, Dimitris on uh, Quarkus. And before I hand over to uh, Dimitri, I'd like to uh, share a couple of slides about the program itself and why it's a great program and we think you should join. Uh, first of all, we have this meetup. So this is uh, the first one, but we have more coming up. We have a session next month. And, and by the way, this is always gonna be the last week of the month on Wednesday, 5 p.m. Central European time. Uh, so we're going to have a session on, from Streamlight. We're going to have a session uh, the following months from V Function. We also have a session uh, on Open Policy Agent, OPA, which is a, an open source project from the CNCF. And uh, another one I can already announce is uh, uh, one from uh, Determine AI on Determine AI, the open source project Determine AI, uh, run by now HP uh, employee from Determine AI. So that's for the meetups and uh, we have a calendar page where you can sign up and uh, we also have the replay links available that on that same page. My colleague Denis is putting in all the links in the chat so you don't have to remember those. In parallel to this, we continue in 2022 our Munch and Learn and we have two coming up. We had one last week and we are going to have two more in February and March, uh, which I can already announce on uh, Determine AI. Uh, from Neil Conway, the, the VP of engineering and also founder of Determine AI. Uh, this is going to be February 16th. Feel free to, to join. And the March 23rd session will be on uh, zero trust uh, security and identity management with Istio and uh, using Spirit, Spiffy Inspire. So uh, that's uh, what we have in the plan for Mention Learn. Just in addition to this, and because some of this, I don't recognize everybody in the list here, so we might have some new users and that's great, um, or new attendees. We have a, another program called Workshops on Demand that might be interesting for some of you. Uh, in our catalog today, we have 25 different workshops and these are Jupyter Notebook based workshops available 24 by seven free and available to everyone. So that's uh, HP employee, but anyone else uh, can take that. Uh, class and we have a lot of open source um, subject in there like Python 101, Rust 101, uh, but we also have um, some on uh, Kubernetes, Data Fabric, and other subjects such as Redfish. I'll take a look at this uh, list and um, give it a try. We have had uh, 20,000, sorry, 2,000 uh, <laughs> workshop run in one year. So the program is quite successful and we'll be happy to, uh, we will be providing more content as we go, but we'll always be happy to listen for feedback on that. And finally, we have a number of uh, interesting channels you might want to join. For example, uh, we have all our events in our events page. We have uh, blogs uh, that you can contribute to because this is a community, uh, it needs to live uh, from members of the community. So we'd be always happy to host a blog. Uh, we have a dedicated page for uh, to show how easy it is to actually contribute on our CMS uh, using your GitHub account. If you master a technology or a topic, we'd be happy to draw, to deliver uh, to have you deliver a meetup. So reach out to us, we can do that. Uh, we have a dedicated HP Dev Slack channel where we advertise all of what we do, plus we have discussions on the different platforms that HPE provides for building software or integrating with. Uh, so take a look in that Slack, you might want to join. Uh, and finally, we 
keep everybody updated with the monthly newsletter uh, that you can subscribe to. So in a nutshell, that's the program. And we're we'll glad that we have all of you here today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, oh, I forgot. There's a QR code you can scan if you're like, don't want to remember all these links that Denis kindly put in the chat, but uh, this uh, QR code you can scan on your phone. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dimitri for the rest of the real session. Thank you all. All right, let me try share my screen. And I forgot to say, but if you have questions, put them in the chat or in the in the Q and A. There's a Q and A uh, dedicated for questions, and Dimitri will uh, answer the questions, or I'll interrupt him with questions depending on the flow. Thank you. All right, excellent. Uh, you can hear me. You can see my slides correctly. Absolutely. All uh, right. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, thanks for coming. Um, my name is uh, Dimitris Andriadis. Um, I've been with Red Hat and JBoss for like 18 years now. Um, I've spent a big part of my career on telecoms and then on the JBoss application server projects, like something like 15 years. I was running the, the application server team for a long time. And the last three years, I'm mostly involved with Quarkus and a couple of other projects that, that we'll call uh, cloud native runtimes at Red Hat. So today I hope to give you a good idea of what is Quarkus, how it works, why we did it, and do some demo and see how that goes. So let's hope the demo guys are good with me today. So, so what is Quarkus? Um, Quarkus is a, is a framework, is a Software stack is a framework of frameworks. Um, it's a way to write cloud native applications. So, so when we say cloud native, we really mean containerized applications that target some sort of a Kubernetes environment. And this is where Quarkus really shines. So think about microservices or serverless applications. Um, that doesn't mean you cannot use Quarkus to write, you know, monoliths or other things like uh, command line interfaces, um, edge deployments when where you want really small, really fast applications. Because at, at the heart of it, Quarkus is really uh, a way to optimize Java. So you can do a lot of things with with it, so I'll, as you will see. But let's focus on you know containerized applications. Um, this is the team that released the first version of Quarkus almost three years ago, uh, close to where I live. Uh, I live in uh, Neuchâtel in uh, Switzerland. Um, and we have covered, this is a part of the team um, that when we made Quarkus public, Quarkus was essentially a research project inside Red Hat for some time had a different name back then. Um, and it's an interesting thing because we brought together an interdisciplinary team from all parts of uh, JBoss slash Red Hat, people working on runtimes, performance, persistence, a um, lot of different people with different ideas, uh, trying to tackle this, this problem which was, you know, what is the best way to write cloud native applications in Java? And we're very much interested in Java. I hope you too as well. Java is now, I think, is the second most popular language out there, especially for um, enterprise applications. And Java is challenged this, in this new environment, this cloud native environment, um, where we had lots of knowledge creating monoliths applications running in application servers, um, running for a long time, having lots of memory. Now, I've been doing that for more than 15 years. Um, but as you're getting smaller, you break the problem into smaller pieces, smaller services, microservices, or even you know, functions. Um, then size matters, density matters, because you end up paying with memory, uh, CPU, so essentially you want to fit in as many 
of your instances in, in, uh, in the runtime. So, so um, Java comes with a disadvantage for two reasons mostly. One is the JVM itself. JVM was written to run in application servers, you know, lots of memory, um, large heaps, time to optimize the application. Uh, and it's doing a great job, a fantastic job. You can get performance that's big higher than C or C++. Um, and that has worked great. But in the cloud where you can deploy a container and you can use any language, and suddenly you have competition from applications written in Go, you know, GS, where, you know, they're essentially smaller. Um, so JVM is one problem, but there's another problem, it's the frameworks themselves. The typical application utilizes um, a lot of frameworks. You write that on a Spring Boot, Spring Boot app, like you want, you want to do a couple of simple things, and then the whole thing ends up bringing so many dependencies that it's just, it's just bloated. Um, um, and this is related also to to Java itself. So Java is very dynamic language. JVM gives you fantastic abilities to do things at runtime, like um, explore your environment, see what's deployed, do magic with proxies, with reflection, uh, and essentially reconfigure yourself based on what you see around you. Um, and this is great, this is great. This gives a lot of uh, capabilities to the developer. Uh, but also it's part of the problem that makes Java bloated for cloud native applications. And you can look at this this way. If you take a typical, let's say medium complexity framework like Hibernate, um, how does it work? Um, normally you compile your application, you get you know, jar files, that's build time phase. And then when you have to run it, uh, Hibernate will have to load configuration coming from different sources like config files, properties, YAML, XML. You need the parsers to you know, read it in memory, the classes for that. Um, nowadays, you have to do a lot of class path scanning. Class path, class loading is one of the most expensive operations in Java. Uh, so there's a lot of discovery there, trying to find the annotation, see what the user wants to do. And with that, build some sort of a meta model in memory that re represents the framework's understanding of the environment and what you want to do. And then based on that, create the final representation, the proxies, wire them together. And at the very last step, you start running things. So you start your third pool, start processing requests and all of that. So the basic idea behind Quark is what if we turn this a bit upside down and try to do as much of this initialization, not when the application starts, but when we built it. So imagine if, if you could do that, if you could enhance the build phase with as much as an initialization as you can, then in theory, um, when, the, when you have to run your application, you have all the information available, you know exactly what you have to do. You don't have to do all this discovery. You can get rid of a lot of initialization code, parsers, bootstrap classes. And with that, you can reduce the memory you require for the application and or start faster. And if you could expand this idea to all the participating frameworks that make up your application, then you might have something you know, smaller and faster. And that's the basic premise behind Quarkus. And the way we do it is uh, we have our normal compilation phase, like this, you know, what you do now, but we introduce an, a mechanism in which for every participating framework, you have an extension that knows Quarkus. And Quarkus then, in this intermediate provisioning assembly phase, it can drive the, the frameworks through the extension 
to do at build time what they will normally do at runtime. So they will say to hibernate, all right, now start initializing your application, your fine configuration, create objects. And there's a very smart mechanism in there in which we introduced some sort of proxy mechanism where those operations are recorded, are recorded. And what we do is we intercept this and at the resulting jar, we write the bytecode that represents the initialization sequence. And then we throw away everything else. So you can imagine when the application starts in the jar file there, what the, the hibernate part goes directly says, you know, I have the answer to the problem. So I'm going to create those 20 options, objects and, and wire them together. And that's it. I don't have to do anything else. Multiply that by the frameworks that make up your applications and you get something, some very interesting uh, uh, optimizations in there. So that's the one side, the Java. Uh, again, Quarkus is totally, let's say, Maven driven. So it's, it's modules. You can also use Cradle, uh, but it's, it's modules uh, for, uh, for Maven. Um, and when you do that, then there's a second part that becomes even more interesting. Uh, you probably heard about uh, ahead of time compilation, GraalVM, those technologies that can essentially take uh, Java application, compile it to native with a lot of uh, restrictions and problems. Uh, but with Quarkus, we solve this problem already at the Java phase. So then we can feed these optimized Java application into a native compiler. <laughs> so, so from this optimized Java image, you can go to a very optimized native image. Let me talk a bit about the, the Graal compiler. Um, the Graal ecosystem itself is huge. What's interesting for this discussion is the compiler, which is in red here. And you can use the Graal compiler as a JIT compiler in the standard uh, Java application. It can replace C2 essentially. And you do that and you can get a nice boost in your application. Some calculated about 5% performance boost. Uh, now what's interesting is the Graal compiler can operate in ahead of time uh, compilation mode where you give it the application and if it's complete and it uses not fancy stuff, it doesn't use let's say reflection for example and some other things, then it can compile this to native. Uh, the substrate VM is a, is a virtual machine written in this um, subset of Java that the graphical compiler likes. So when you compile Kraal compiler, substrate VM, your application and the foundation libraries in the JDK, you can come up with a native executable. Now, uh, there's, a dark side, there's a dark side to it in that Kraal VM on its own native compilation, it's not, it's not very easy to use. There's things that are not supported. You cannot do dynamic class loading. There's no invoke the dynamic, no finalizer, security manager, no JMX. So you cannot have that stuff. And then other stuff that are very common in Java, like reflection, dynamic proxies, static initializers, all those need some special treatment to make it work. Uh, so compiling a normal application into native code is it's most probably will not gonna work. However, this is where Quarkus really shines because with Quarkus, if you stay within the Quarkus ecosystem extension, you're practically guaranteed that whatever you make will compile to native by just adding one flag essentially. Because Quarkus, the Quarkus extensions know how to avoid those things that RALVM doesn't like and to provide the right hints 
uh, in, for the already optimized Java code for GraalVM to do its work. So anyway, we talked a lot about this. Uh, so why it's important? Because with Quarkus, you can expect to optimize your application. Uh, let's say rule of thumb is if you take a standard, let's say microservice application and you port it to Quarkus, memory expectations will fall to about half of it. So if it used to take a giga of memory now, it's gonna be 500 megabytes and it, it will likely start five times faster. So you could reduce your cloud bill to half essentially with Quarkus and you know, get much better performance. And if you go the extra step, you go all the way to native, then of course, memory requirements fall even more, like about a fifth of the memory initially used and boot times are crazy. They can be like 50 times faster or hundred times faster. It depends on the application. Um, when to use what with Quarkus, Java, full Java or native, it really depends for longer line running applications. Java is still the best choice. It's the fastest, it's the more mature. We have all the you know, usual tools um, to run, debug the application. We have excellent garbage collectors. Um, so it's quite fine to stay in the Java side with Quarkus. And when you do that, of course, you can include all sorts of libraries for which you, you may not have an extension and it still works because it's just Java. Now, if you wanna go native, then staying within the Quarkus ecosystem is what guarantees that the compilation will actually work. And this will give you essentially the, the highest density and the fastest boot time. So if you want to do, for example, functions or you know, serverless, then obviously this is the best uh, bet. But then you are into native land. There's no JVM anymore. It's an executable where JVM and your code is like one thing. So you have to use native debuggers and different type of tools. So um, show me some code. Let's let's hope this will work. Um, I'd like to give you some idea of you know how Quarkus looks like. Um, let me do this. All right. So to start with Quarkus, you go to the website. It's a button there. Start coding. Let me make this a bit bigger, yeah. So you basically get an initializer screen where you can look at the different extensions. There are quite many, I think there are 480 at this uh, moment. And you can search, you can find, give me for example, the Spring extensions. We have compatibility layer in Quarkus where we implement Spring APIs, popular Spring APIs that use Quarkus implementations underneath if you don't want to change your application a lot. But of course we have tons of things related to, um, you know, stuff that you, you usually uh, use in the cloud, you know, Kafka, uh, messaging, messaging. Um, you can filter by, you know, different criteria here, you know, JDBC drivers, asynchronous stuff. So th there's really, really a lot. So, and if there's not, you can always write your own extension, right? So from there, you can generate your application and start coding. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna use a different mode here. Um, maybe I should make this a little bigger. All right, so, um, so again, Quarkus is Maven modules, but there's also a CLI. So there's a Quarkus CLI. Quarkus, let's see, Quarkus. All right, maybe I should make it a little bit bigger, this one. And in the Quarkus CLI, you can easily create a demo application by saying Quarkus create app, remember. Uh, 
And this will create a skeleton up for you. So this is all here. And pretty much you can go and, you know, fire up an IDE. I'll use VS Code to start working on it immediately. So if I look what it produced here, it's a very simple, let's say microservice. Uh, it, it has an endpoint that will say hello, essentially. Uh, what's interesting to see is this code here is all standard Java. So with Quarkus, we don't reinvent the wheel. We use uh, popular uh, standard APIs or de facto standards. Uh, so there's nothing Quarkus specific uh, in here, as you can see. Now, um, the idea with Quarkus is that um, you go into the ID and you stay there. So um, you can start Quarkus here, like in the command line, uh, in what we call the dev mode. Uh, so this one here will compile Quarkus and, and start it in a special mode where Quarkus comes through some additional capabilities. That's compiling. And it's starting. So now Quarkus start, started and I should be able to see it uh, here if I go localhost. So Quarkus is running and, and it says, hello, if I click here, hello STZ, it's the, let's say default implementation. Now to play with it a bit, um, let's say we wanna say, uh, hello, let's be devs, save here. Go back here and refresh. And the change is immediately shown in the browser. Now this, I don't know if you realize this, but uh, sorry, where's the code? Let's put some, those things go back here, refresh. And the change is immediately there. So rem remember this is, this is compiled Java. That's not JavaScript or stuff like that. So how this magic happens, well, the way it does is when I hit refresh in the browser, Quarkus detects this. And what it does, it, it stops the server, recompiles the change, restarts the server, and lets, lets the request go through. And this happened now on this laptop, which is like three years old, and I have the camera also that takes power. Uh, in 0.6 seconds, you know. Uh, so it creates a very nice development flow where you just stay here and you, you know, you do your, your thing and Quarkus, you know, immediately cuts this up. So this is really, really fast. Uh, if I go back here, let's say I go to the console. Yeah. Um, so when Quarkus starts in development mode, it comes with a nice, what we call dev UI. So this is not included when Quarkus um, uh, does its normal compilation, it's only development. And in here, you can see the different modules that run in Quarkus at this moment. And some of them, you know, you are clickable, you can go and change the configuration of the runtime. There are nice links that point back to documentation, to the different guides. Um, hey, Dimitri, and, there's, yes. a, there's a question in the in the chat from uh, from Jerome that's asked uh, how would you and while you're in the in the code, maybe you can show that how would you use breakpoints and debug with Quarkus? It's um, it's, so, it's like you do with any application. Then in this, at this, um, in this uh, case, I shouldn't start Quarkus like I did here in the control. Uh, I should 
started through the ID so it can set the right uh, breakpoints, but it's like like any normal application. Um, let me go back here and show you. So this is a POM of Quarkus. Um, where you, this is where you essentially declare your dependencies on extensions. Let me do that. Um, so we have the rest is the extension, which is like the, the endpoint. If I uh, if I do the, you know, let's choose the less easy reactive one and save. Then Quarkus detects this and restarts. And if I go there and refresh, you see immediately you, I have the new extension presence, the rest is reactive. And because the extensions are smart and they can enhance the developer console, uh, can do things like, okay, give me the endpoints or give me, do some more fancy things. So for example, Quarkus here implements some heuristics. This is a reactive extension. So basically it can serve the request in the IO thread. But this heuristic here says that, you know, for Quarkus to be on the safe side, let me go back to the code here. Uh, yeah, where is it? So this is my resource, right? So to be on the safe side, Quarkus will dispatch this in the memory, in the thread pool, um, this request. But if I know that, you know, I want, this to make a reactive call. I'm not doing any fancy stuff behind. I could go and say, make this a non-blocking endpoint. And if I go back here, you see Carcus did that, did recompiled everything, checked the heuristics and now says, oh, it's perfect now. It's, <laughs> you fixed it essentially. <laughs> yeah, you can, do lots of things like this. Uh, let's see. You can add more extensions. Let me, where is it here? Yeah. Let me try as an extension. Um, you can do this through the CLI as well. You can do it through this through Maven. Um, let me add a small rhyme. Um, metrics. I think close the changes. If I go back to my dev UI, I should have a metrics comp. Yep, I have a metrics component now. So I, I could go and say, you know, show me red metrics for the runtime, like, um, you know base metrics or vendor metrics. So you can, you know, stay on in the ID essentially. Um, something that we added like a couple of releases ago, which is interesting also, we've added testing abilities here in the dev mode. So you see this, this thing here, there's a help facility the thing, type of things you can do. So if I say R, the resume testing, what it does is it will check the tests and it will run them. And it runs in the smart way. So whenever, as I'm coding, it knows what code I'm touching and it won't run all the tests. So basically this fails now and why it fails because my greeting resource, I change this string and somewhere there's a test that expects something different. So expect hello rest easy. So if I'm if I'm to fix this in some way, let me let's make it a bit more configurable a bit. Uh, put a config property. Do the whole value. Of course, I'm making some mistakes. Uh, 
All right, let's do this here. And I'll do the same in the, the test. We need the right import. Yep. Save. So you see now that the test has turned green. Um, okay, let me stop that for a bit. So this has stop. I'll go back to here. We have a question in the in the chat. Maybe you want to uh, to check. I'm not sure I can I understand it, but. Uh, would the application work if we use non quarkus dependencies in pom.xml? That's the question. In Java mode, it will absolutely work. Yes, it's just standard Java. Yes. Thank you. I don't see the question somehow there. Um, okay, maybe I, all right, chat. All right, I have it now, sorry. I'm not so much a Zoom fan, so. <laughs> I've used everything else but Zoom, okay. Yep, yeah, so yeah, you can add any dependence you like, it will work. Um, so if I want to compile, you can use Maven, as we said, but you can use also the ID, Quarkus build. So this will do a standard build. Um, we'll run the tests, of course, and everything. When Quark loads, you can see the components that get activated. So like here, so those are the extensions that I'm using. And, and then you can just run the application with a standard fashion um, Quark. Up. And So, yeah. So, it's a, there are different ways that Quarkus can package your application, like fat jar, thin jar, solid jar, all sorts of things. Um, and, and again, um, what you see here is, is rather slow because I'm doing the webcast, the camera works, and everything. So, Quarkus started in 1.6 seconds. But if I had the camera closed and everything, you would see something like half a second or faster on, on, a, on a newer laptop. Uh, and of course, uh, Quarkus includes everything. There's, you can still see metrics, but in this mode, there's no dev console. You know, it is supposed to be ready for production. Um, now, similarly, Let's say now I want to produce a native app with Quarkus. All you have to do is let's say Quarkus built, make it native. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to skip the tests because I, I, I'd have to do the native test. Of, uh, um, no tests. Oh, yeah. I think I'm missing this. And now Quarkus will do a native build. It will invoke uh, different things. You know, it, do, it will do its magic now. It will take a couple of minutes. So I think it's better I go back to the slides and we'll go back to the compilation later. So why Quarkus? Again, um, it's the performance advantage. Uh, you can really go smaller and faster. and According to our numbers, Quarkus right now is the fastest thing out there. Do your own benchmarking uh, and decide for yourselves. But at the core of it, I think it's this architecture with extensions that can trim down the libraries to the absolute minimum. And the nice thing with Quarkus is as the extension ecosystem, both 
gets bigger and also more mature because an extension can do very basic things. Like at the, the least it can do is, for example, let's say provide hints to GraalVM to deal with reflection. But a more advanced extension will actually change the way the code operates so that there's no reflection at all. So it can be avoided completely. Uh, so this idea that you can do optimization at build time changes radically the way we think about Java. So you can see a lot of innovation coming from this space uh, going forward. Um, developer joy, I think that was one of our goals from the beginning. It's where I saw you. Uh, we want things to work you know, most of the time without having to think. Uh, developer mode, embedded testing, uh, unified configuration. I didn't show that, but Quarkus essentially puts everything in one file, anything is there. Um, things work out of the box for most things and the rest are just possible uh, if you wanna do more advanced things. Um, then something we didn't talk at all today is uh, reactive. So Quarkus is built on a reactive core. Uh, at the core of Quarkus, we have Vertex. It's another project at Red Hat, which is much, much older than Quarkus. And it's one of the standards in the area. So under the hood, Quarkus is reactive. And on top of it, it builds um, imperative um, blocking APIs. But you have the options to do both. And there's a lot of innovation coming from this space as well. We just introduced Hibernate Reactive. So if you really want like really performant applications where you have full control of the early IO threads and everything, this is possible with Quarks as well. Uh, best of it, frameworks and standards. So we don't reinvent the wheel. We use standard Java enterprise APIs, micro profile APIs some spring APIs, um, de facto standards like Hibernate or you know, and other libraries. Um, so the learning curve with Quarkus is quite, it's quite small actually. We, we have uh, uh, examples of people that were able to migrate applications in a matter of, of weeks or even days and start being pro pro productive very fast. Um, we also seen cases with, you know, by using more standard APIs, the code gets smaller. Uh, we have uh, Vodafone moved over, you know, a big a set of microservices, and then the result was about thirty percent code to maintain. So that's obviously a big win. Um, and innovation. So on those, those on top of those standard APIs, we've added new things. We have added, for example, a new ORM layer called Panache, uh, a templating engine called Qt, uh, portable extensions if you, wanna, if you wanna do functions on Amazon or Azure, uh, new reactive APIs, uh, Hibernate reactive. Uh, um, and it's this idea that, uh, you know, as soon as you get with grips with the idea that you can make optimizations at build time, changes the way you think about uh, about java so for example let's say you want to deploy an application with a certain database and you know that beforehand so that means you don't have to include 20 different dialects with your orm provider um, or let's say you have some sort of data exchange through some json uh, if you know that beforehand maybe the type of parsing you're doing can be optimized at build time. Um, so you get the idea. Um, and with Quarkus as well, people realize that, you know, oh, oh wait, Java can now be used in other cases. So, so there's a framework built on top of Quarkus that uh, allows you to write uh, Kubernetes operators that you normally be built with uh, Go. Now you can do it in Java. And other people are using Quarkus to write uh, ads applications that run or uh, ARM devices with you know minimal uh, uh, memory uh, requirements and and stuff like that. Um, ARM-based devices. Well, if you if you have Java running there, sure. Um, 
what's what's been work now is the um, the the compile to native part, so it can support ARM. So this is uh, in the works as well. Um, now about the project, um, we have a very big active community with Quarkus. Now at, at this point, we have something like 500 contributors to Quarkus and half of them are Red Hat. The rest are you know, from the wider community. Uh, we've been very, very active. So the community project releases a new release every month, uh, as you can see here, and point releases as well as needed. So every release, every monthly release can bring in new features. We try to do this in a way that's not too invasive. So we really try hard not to break people, or if we do, to make it as painless as possible. Um, and then we fix stuff, you know, we, we can turn out releases. I mean, in the first year where we calculated that we released Quarkus on average one every nine days, in the first uh, year of its, uh, you know, community project life. Uh, so that's the community side. We do support Quarkus fully as a product. Um, and the way we do that on the product side is essentially every six months, we fork the community project. So you can stay on a release for longer. You don't have to upgrade every month. You stay in the same feature release for let's say, six months. And we repeat the exercise uh, every six months if you want to be on a, a bit slower release, the release train. Um, and then you get access to Quarkus either. It's part of other bundles. So if you get Red Hat Enterprise Linux, you get Quarkus, if you get Open JDK, the, the Red Hat version, you get Quarkus. If you get OpenShift, you get Quarkus. So um, we don't mean on making money on Quarkus. We look at it as an enabler for other, all the other products that build on Quarkus. Um, there are you know products in Red Hat that now utilize Quarkus. The SSO it produces a special version which is miniaturized with Quarkus. We have Cogito for writing rules using Quarkus. Um, Camel uh, Fuse is now using Quarkus. And there's a very big active contrib contributor community with extension writers that use Quarkus to you know, make it work with their uh, libraries and products. We're 10 minutes on the hour. I, I left some time you know, to, for questions. So I think we can take questions as well. Ah, let me go back here. Okay, let's do that. So the build is finished. It took almost three minutes on my slow environment. And if I look, you know, what, what's produced file target. Um, so I have a native executable whose size is, let's see. So it's about 40 megabytes. So this 40 megabyte executable, it contains the, you know, the JVM, my code, all the libraries, and I should be able to run it like this. So it started in 25 milliseconds on my, slow environment if you do it on your laptop it would likely start in something like eight um, and it has all the usual things you can say hello uh, you know it has metrics where's my metrics you know all the stuff is still there and i didn't have to do anything if you remember i just said Compile to native. Let's just add this flag. So, so that was cool. Um, other questions? We have a few minutes left. Okay. How about Docker, total Docker image size? Let me say this first. Uh, first of all, now I did all locally on my machine. Um, there's also a mode where you use a Docker image that has. Uh, uh, GraalVM and all the environment installed. So you can do the build 
into that image and produce uh, the executable um, in there. Um, the image size depends very much on what the layers of your base image are. So if you use a very thin image with a, a version of um, Linux that's you know really minimal and all that, um, Quarkus doesn't have really many dependencies like uh, for the native mode. So it really depends on, on GraalVM. So GraalVM has a couple of dependencies there, a couple of libraries that it needs for the native mode, but it, it, it's not much. So it, it's really up to you how much you can play and reduce this to whatever is, is good for you. Any documents, links to convert any open source libraries to Quarkus wrapped? Um, yeah, um, so first of all, Java mode, you don't have to do any conversion, right? Now, if you want to write an extension, um, Quarkus IO, there are guides. If I go to the guides here, there must be writing extension. Yeah, it's here. So there's lots of material, you know, to get to understand the idea behind the extension. If you're really into that, I think it's brilliant. This, this thing that Quarkus does where it uses some facility to monitor what you're doing and write the bytecode down into the jar file. I think this is unique to Quarkus and it explains why it's so special and why it's hard to beat Quarkus unless you do the same thing, essentially. I don't know if you have the Q&A open because there's one question over there. Oh, yeah, I have it, yeah. Can you write a reference about Kubernetes integration? Um, references, well, uh, we do have a lot of um, Kubernetes related extensions. If you go here, there is stuff to tell you more how to do that. Um, there's also ways, Quarkus helps a lot with uh, deploying to, to give Kubernetes. So I didn't show you today, but you can tell Quarkus while you compile, you know, make the deploy to Kubernetes, essentially. It requires a bit of configuration, but you can uh, deploy to Kubernetes. Also something I didn't tell you at all today is uh, Quarkus contains some facilities to help you with the development. So for example, if it detects, if it detects that you need, let's say a database as the backend to your JP application, it can start behind the scenes, a container with a database and wire it with your application. So you don't have to do anything. <laughs> so this, this development mode allows a lot of flexibilities for the extension writers to help the developers to, when using Quarkus. So I think, I think it, it really is a, a game changer. Um, you know, breathing some fresh air into, into Java for the next, whatever, 10 years or so. I don't see any other questions, uh, Dimitri, right now. So let me bring up the, the end of session poll real quick uh, to ask you just three simple questions uh, to our audience about the usefulness of the session. Um, you can continue to ask questions, everybody, if you have one more, a few more questions, uh, that's mm -hmm. okay. Otherwise, please give an answer to the, the quick poll. And if no one has answered any questions. Uh, I'd like to thank you, um, Dimitri. I think that was great. Great uh, first uh, meetup for us. I'm sure uh, Quarkus is now a lot clearer to most of us, as you say, a fresh air for the years to come in Java programming, for sure. Um, if yeah. are... Give it a try. I mean, uh, there's a very active community. We're, we're very interested in feedback. And normally we can fix things very fast. If something doesn't work for you, our guys can you know, fix it in the next release like next week or next two weeks so so those turnaround times are just incredible you know if you're used to like old style uh, product development so 
yeah jo join us i mean uh, it's fun okay thank you very much as well thank you dimitri <laughs> thank you everyone for joining thank you for answering the poll and uh, we'll we'll talk to you in one month for our next uh, meetup thank you very much everyone thank you everyone.